The reading is from Ephesians 3, verse 1. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ on behalf of you, Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal promise that he re has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Amen. Good morning, Ruby. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, today is a notable first for St. Barnabas. It's our first baby dedication uh, ceremony service, and we're absolutely delighted that Giovanni gets his name first on the honours board. And welcome to the godparents. It's lovely to have you with us as well, and we look forward to the special dedication for him at the end of the service. Then just a gentle reminder that this week we have our monthly prayer meeting online, and uh, the lots and lots of different needs uh, around the church family at the moment. Can I ask you please to let me have your personal prayer request by tomorrow night so that we can get the outline to you on time for those who need to print it off before we meet uh, on Wednesday evening. Good. Well, would you please keep the passage open in front of you that Ruby has just read for us and uh, let me pray as we begin. The psalmist writes that your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Well, Heavenly Father, we do pray this morning that you would shine the light of your word very brightly indeed into our lives and especially into those dark places where so many of us are struggling and battling and facing challenges. So speak clearly, we pray. Have mercy on us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there is a place in the Gospel of Matthew uh, where the Lord Jesus looks ahead to the future of the church and he makes this rather chilling prediction. <clears throat> he says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. That's Matthew 24, verse 12. Of course, the, the increase of wickedness is put before us, isn't it, on a daily basis? We, we can't escape it. We don't really want to think about it. Uh, but we certainly can't deny it. But what is perhaps rather less obvious is the fulfillment of the second half of Jesus' prediction in that verse. Namely, that because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. He's talking about the church. And he's saying that in the church, man's love for God and the things of God, that love will grow cold. 
Now, I say that's less obvious because, of course, here in South Africa, uh, we're living in a Christian country according to Operation World. Uh, 75% of the population here claim the name of Christ. And on paper, that sounds splendid. But uh, among that 75%, how many actually have a sincere love for Christ, a sincere love for other Christians? How many are truly gospel-minded? Isn't it actually the truth that so many who call themselves Christians have found that over the years their love for God and the things of God has started to grow cold? A couple of years ago, um, a Chinese missionary was visiting a friend of ours, and uh, this missionary noted a striking contrast between the spiritual temperature here compared to his part of China. So, for example, uh, he noted that here in the West, people frequently arrive late for church. But in China, he says people arrive half an hour early. He also noted that in the West, uh, people take Holy Communion, the, the Lord's Supper, in a rather sort of mechanical, uh, empty way. But in the part of China that he comes from, when people take Communion, when they take the Lord's Supper, they do so with tears. They weep. Now, of course, that's only anecdotal evidence. But I do think it confirms what some of us feel intuitively. Uh, that while the spiritual temperature is definitely rising in parts of the third world, in parts of the West, and even here in Cape Town, the spiritual temperature, I suggest, is cooling. Now, of course, yes, there are many, many sincere Christian people in Cape Town who are very much on fire for Christ. Yesterday, it was my great privilege to spend the morning with our good friends down at the United Evangelical Fellowship in Fishhook. They were celebrating their 10 years anniversary. The hall was packed. We had a splendid time. Went on for two and a half hours. And uh, the pastor, Pastor John Broom, aged 80, was obliged to sing a solo. I was rather glad I got let off that last year. But anyway, there are people there who are thoroughly on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. But as wickedness continues to accelerate in South Africa, I think that the warning Jesus gives about spiritual coldness and spiritual complacency is a serious warning for us. And in our passage this morning, Paul is inviting us to check the spiritual temperature of our own hearts by testing our attitude to church. Now, how do I get that from the text? Last week, we saw Paul was encouraging the Christians in Ephesus to embrace their new status as a holy temple in which God lives by his spirit. And he's in the text, he's about to pray that they'll do that when he suddenly foresees a potential problem. So come with me to verse 1. Verse 1. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, he's about to pray, he checks himself, and he doesn't actually pick up on the prayer till verse 14, where he continues, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now, I point this out to you because verses 2 to 13 are a digression. Uh, if you like, Paul is taking us off down a little side road. Why the side road? Well, Paul realises that all of a sudden his imprisonment might raise quite a few eyebrows in the congregation. Well, of course it would, wouldn't it? I mean, imagine you arrive here next Sunday morning and uh, at 9.30 Mariano steps into the pulpit and he says, well, I'm really sorry, but during the week uh, all the elders of the church were arrested They've been given extremely long prison sentences in Portsmouth. I doubt you'll see them for some considerable time. Now, at that moment, what would you be thinking? Some of you might be thinking, well, I wonder if the elders at St. Barnabas were the real deal. 
Was their ministry from God, or were they actually frauds? And what does that mean for us? Now, that is the situation at this point in the letter. Paul is writing from prison in Rome, and he's concerned that the Christians in Ephesus might be discouraged. And that, of course, is why he says in verse 13, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings. So, you see, he wants to reassure these Christians that he's not in prison because of some hideous moral failure or because of God's judgment on his ministry. He's not. Rather, the very reason he's there is because of his obedience to Christ. And that's why he describes himself in verse 1 not as a prisoner of Rome, but as the prisoner of Christ Jesus. And then he explains what he means. And by way of defense, he, he tells them how he was commissioned for ministry. So what he's doing here is he's answering the unspoken question, how do we know we can trust you? So we're going to start by looking very briefly at Paul's answer to that unspoken question. But then I want to spend most of our time thinking about the implications of Paul's answer for us here this morning. By the way, um, this is actually one of the most important passages in the New Testament on the significance of the church. And it means, I think, that the way we respond to Paul's message will actually tell us whether our own hearts are hot or cold towards Jesus. So first then, how did Paul receive his ministry? Uh, in the passage, Paul says God gave him two things as gifts of God's grace. He actually uses that phrase twice, doesn't he? Uh, once in verse 2, and then again in verse 7. And when we put those two things together, we begin to see why the church is so very precious in the sight of God, and therefore why it ought to be very precious to us as well. So first, in verses 2 to 6, Paul says he was given a mystery. Now, if you cast your mind back to our very first study in Ephesians, you'll remember that we saw uh, that the word mystery in the Bible has got a very specific meaning. When you and I think of a mystery, we think about a secret. But when the Bible talks about a mystery, uh, it's talking about new information from God. Uh, it's something we wouldn't actually know unless God himself told us. And here, Paul says in verse 3 that the mystery was made known to him by revelation, and that the mystery is about Christ, verse 4. So Paul was given fresh information about the work of Christ. What on earth was it? He tells us in verse 6, he says, the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. And you might say, how on earth is that new information? Uh, after all, uh, the Old Testament says that God always planned to bless not just Israel, but all the nations of the world. Uh, that, after all, was in his promise to Abraham, wasn't it, right at the beginning? And uh, Isaiah says that Israel was meant to be a light for the nations. All of that is true. But you see, the Old Testament did not say that Israel's privilege as the kingdom of God on earth would be terminated and that Israel in the Old Testament would be replaced by the church. Now that was new information. That was the revelation that Paul received from God, that the church replaces Israel 
as the focus of God's activity on earth, with Jew and Gentile both enjoying equal access to God on exactly the same terms. And now all of God's plans and purposes for the world are channeled through the church. Now we're going to say more about that in a moment. But notice secondly in verse 7, Paul says he was also given a commission. He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. Now what that means is that the apostle didn't suddenly uh, wake up one morning and say, you know, I've been considering a number of different possible career options, and I think I really would like to be an apostle. That was not how it happened. God gave Paul this new information about the church as the focus of all God's plans, and then God sent Paul out to tell the world. Verse 9 says that he was sent out to make it plain to everybody. Now you see, if God hadn't done that, we wouldn't actually have the 13 letters from Paul in the New Testament, which tell us more about the church than anything else. That's how Paul received his ministry. He received it from God, and it was precisely because he'd been so faithful to his ministry that he ended up in prison. Okay, all of that is introduction. What does this mean for you and me this morning? In particular, what can we learn from this passage about the church? Let me suggest there are three vital implications. I'll tell you what they are. We'll look at them quickly together. Number one, number one, the church is at the center of the gospel. Now, there are a lot of Christians today who don't know this. We need to think about it. Second, the church is at the center of history. Well, the world doesn't know that, does it? The world needs to know that. And third, the church grows through the humble and the weak. Well, that's a surprise. So firstly then, the church is at the center of the gospel. Now, I suppose almost every church these days has its own mission statement. Uh, here at St. Barnabas, our mission statement is to be a beacon church of Bible teaching and Bible life. That's our purpose. And we pray God would give us the strength to live it out. But Paul shows us that when God looks at the church, he's got an even greater purpose in mind. Come with me to verse 10. Verse 10, very important verse. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Now remember, please, that throughout Ephesians, Paul has been painting a, a picture of the church as a multicultural a multiracial community brought together through the preaching of the gospel. Uh, in the flesh, these people have got almost nothing in common. Everything is against them getting on. But Paul says that the gospel brings them together so that they become a united community. And Paul says that this united community is a revelation, follow the text, of the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Now that word translated manifold, it's not a part on a motor car, uh, it means literally many colored. It's the word that they use to describe flowers or embroidered cloth uh, or woven carpets. Now, why does Paul use that word here? Well, Paul is saying, you see, that it is that as a multiracial, multicultural community united by the gospel, that the church becomes a beautiful tapestry. In other words, there's something uniquely beautiful about the balance between the diversity on the one hand 
and the harmony of the members on the other. Diverse membership, harmonious membership. It might take many years to achieve that in any one particular church. But when a church does look like that, God is showing the hostile cosmic powers something that they never knew before and that they can't see anywhere else on planet Earth. It's a display of the full spectrum of God's wisdom. Now that's a pretty massive claim. How does it work? Well, ever since the fall, you know perfectly well that sin has been smashing families, breaking down communities, because sin always separates people from one another. I guess Africans know probably more about that than most other races on earth. But you see, the gospel, the gospel reverses the divisive effects of sin. And it brings together people who otherwise might never even speak to each other, let alone love one another. And when the gospel does that, it shows that God is wiser and stronger than any evil that threatens to divide us. Okay? I mean, just look at us this morning. You know, there are people in this room from Malawi and from Zimbabwe and from South Sudan and from Namibia, even from the United Kingdom and, of course, South Africa. See, everything on paper, everything is against our unity, isn't it? Everything. But as God brings us together through the gospel and makes us a family of people praying for one another, caring for one another, encouraging one another. God is giving the vast legions of cosmic powers in the heavenly realms a picture of what is going to happen on the last day when he unites all things in heaven and on earth under one head, even Christ. As one of the commentators puts it, the church is God's pilot scheme for the reconciled universe of the future. We've got an anticipation of the future going on right here in this room this morning. So whenever the hostile powers look at the church of Jesus, they actually know they're defeated. They know that. Now, of course, they haven't given up yet. That's why the Apostle Paul is in prison. There will be setbacks, there'll be suffering along the way, but the outcome is not in doubt. So friends, the church is at the center of the gospel, and you and I need to take that to heart this morning. You know, I guess in most of our circles we've had it drummed into us, haven't we, that uh, becoming a Christian is a personal matter. And of course, yes, that is true at one level. But it's not the whole story. It's not. Because when God saves us from our sin, he also saves us from our solitude. And he brings us into this unique, multicultural, multiracial family. Now, some of us might have had experiences of church that were less than fortunate and uh, perhaps were rather hesitant about getting involved. But Paul knows that. He's not naive. I mean, most of his letters, if you think about it, in the New Testament are written to churches that were in some kind of trouble and desperately needed sorting out. I mean, imagine being asked to become a member of the church at Corinth. I mean, what a shambles that was. But you see, listen to me very carefully here. Because what verse 10 means is that I cannot be uninvolved in the life of a local church and claim to be a Christian at the same time. I can't. If I've been truly reconciled to God through the gospel, it means I've been reconciled to my brothers and sisters in the church and God is calling me to demonstrate that by my active involvement in the life and welfare of the church family. 
Well, there's a lot to think about there, but we must hasten on. Because our second uh, implication or application this morning is that the church is at the very center of history. Now, there are plenty of people today, uh, you may know them, who think of the church as purely a human institution. Uh, They think it was man's idea, and they think that, quite frankly, it's past its sell-by date. It's irrelevant. This passage will not allow us to say that. Look at verse 11. Verse 11. Michael hinted at this earlier. Paul says that God's plan for the church is according to his eternal purpose. Now please, will you think very carefully about this with me? Because it means that God planned the church before he created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Gillian and I grew up in uh, England, and for the last few years we were there. We were living in a part of England where there are plenty of churches that are very old indeed, going back before the Middle Ages. Uh, We went into a number of churches that were more than a thousand years old. And uh, whenever a tourist uh, visits the United Kingdom and visits one of these splendid buildings, maybe one of the great cathedrals, uh, Canterbury, Winchester, or wherever it is, A typical comment will be, while I was in that building, I felt really close to God. People will say that. Somehow kind of the age and the the architecture of the building made God seem a bit more real to them. Paul says, a thousand years, that's nothing. If you really want to understand the church, you've got to actually look back back before the creation of the world because that is when God laid the foundation stone for the church but someone will say okay I hear you Simon but surely the church has outgrown its usefulness Uh, on all the important issues its authority has been overtaken by politicians um, the media certain members of the royal family. Uh, It's only a matter of time, isn't it, before the church disappears altogether. Well, again, this passage will not let us say that. Now, we've got to do a little bit of detective work here, so I'm going to make your fingers do some work. Do you remember that Paul said that uh, God revealed a mystery to him? And uh, Paul uses that word mystery four times in the text. And the point is that right at the centre of the mystery is the church. Okay, so we're going to be detectives for a minute or two. Outside the letters of the Apostle Paul, and I think it's just two references in the book of Revelation, the only other place where we find the word mystery in the whole of the Bible is in the book of Daniel. And what we find there helps us to understand what Paul is talking about here. So won't you please travel with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 2 in the Old Testament. If you need some navigational help, start by finding Isaiah. After Isaiah, there's Jeremiah, and then Lamentations, and then Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. Now Daniel lived about 600 years before Paul was writing this letter. He was part of just a tiny, tiny minority in Israel who remained faithful to God. But when God sent Israel into exile, uh, Daniel was caught up in that sort of cataclysmic event and taken prisoner to Babylon by the invading armies of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you think about it, at that time, if there had been social media, what would social media have been saying about God and the gospel? They would have been saying, everything that Israel believed in and hoped for can't possibly have been true. I mean, just look at them. I mean, where is their God now? 
and you can understand many people would have said something rather like that. Because in those days, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man in the world. Uh, I suppose if you want a modern day analogy, he was uh, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump rolled into one. He was a total egomaniac who was utterly convinced that his empire would last forever. And he was a very serious threat to the people of God. But Nebuchadnezzar had a problem. He had bad dreams. No one could interpret those dreams. But God revealed the meaning of those dreams to Daniel, who explained them to the king. So please come with me to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 27. And we all see verse 27 in our Bibles. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he's asked about. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. As you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries, that's God, the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. And then Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar about all the kingdoms and all of the empires that are going to follow after him. And history has confirmed to us that Daniel's description of each of those kingdoms has been fulfilled perfectly. Now come with me to verse 44. Verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. And 600 years later, Jesus arrives in Galilee and he announces that he is God's king and he has come to set up God's eternal kingdom. And when Jesus says that, he is talking about the church. And Jesus says that the future of the church is so secure that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Was Jesus wrong about that? Many people think he was. In the 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth, many people have predicted the imminent collapse of the church. Hasn't happened yet, has it? What has happened? Well, what's happened is that although Jesus began with just 12 disciples... Today, there are 2.5 billion Christians on planet Earth. So in spite of all the Nebuchadnezzars that have tried to wipe out the church in places like China, North Korea, Afghanistan, Pakistan, there are more Christians actually in those countries today than there have ever been before. And that, you see, my friends, is because the church is at the center of history. And though there are going to be times, many times, when the church appears to be weak and irrelevant, God is working through all the events of human history to the moment when Jesus will return and take the church that he's purchased with his blood to be with him forever in a perfect new creation. Can I ask you this morning, 
What is your attitude to church? Do you think of the church as weak and irrelevant? Or do you see it as the centerpiece of God's plans? Do you see the church as dull, ugly? Or do you perhaps see the church as the bride of Christ, purchased by his precious blood and infinitely precious to him? Because, you see, the way that you answer that question will be a tremendous clue as to whether your heart is hot or cold towards Christ. Well, come back to Ephesians 3 as we consider very briefly the third implication for us this morning, which is that the church grows through the humble and the weak. I think, you know, given what we've said about the church this morning and its importance, surely we would expect the leaders of the church to be super impressive people. So the way that the Apostle Paul describes himself here is, I think, a massive surprise. Look with me at verse 8. Paul says, although I am less than the least of all God's people, This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Interestingly, for those of you who like the original languages, the literal translation of Paul's words there would be, I am the leaster of all God's people. I mean, that's an extraordinary statement, isn't it? Paul is so utterly persuaded of his own unworthiness for ministry that he actually has to invent a word to describe it. I am the leaster of all God's people. And that isn't false modesty on Paul's part. As a proud young man, he had persecuted the church. And won't you please remember that he wasn't commissioned by Christ after an exhaustive search for young men with outstanding Bible knowledge and great organizational ability. No, he wasn't. Paul was commissioned by Christ with his face in the dust of the Damascus Road. And that's why you see elsewhere, Paul describes himself as the least of the apostles and the worst of sinners, because that is honestly... That is honestly how he saw himself. And yet God did more to establish the church through this man than anybody else apart from Jesus. Now, it is exactly the same with us. The lesson for us, particularly those training for pastoral ministry, is that all true gospel ministry springs from a deep humbling of the servant. There's actually no place in gospel ministry for human pride. D.T. Niles was a missionary to India in the 20th century, and he was once asked to define Christian ministry. This is what he said. It's about one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Think about that. Christian ministry is about one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. So it's not the charismatic leader with terrific stage presence. It's not the entertainer who's terrific at telling stories. It's not the academic who spends all his time in the library. No, it's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. See, friends, it's only when we know that we are beggars that we start to be useful in God's church. Because, you see, until we get to that point, there'll be so much of me that people won't see Jesus. They won't actually see the unsearchable riches of Christ. And isn't it true, friends, that so much of what stands in the way of the church becoming the beautiful tapestry that displays God's wisdom is actually our own refusal 
to see ourselves as God sees us. Isn't that right? So may God open our eyes this morning so that we might see ourselves as we truly are. Sinners, shaved, saved by sheer grace, nothing else. So that we might value the church more than we do and that we might truly love one another as God has loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us so clearly the significance of the church in your eternal plans. Please forgive us for those times when we've been casual or complacent in our attitude to church. Thank you for showing us that when we bow before your throne, that you grow the church through people as messed up and broken as we are. And we ask that as we do that, that you would recommission us for lives of useful service in our church family here at St. Barnabas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.